All right, this is part two on our stoichiometry series. The last problems we did started off, and basically this was the idea of the last problems. If I gave you an equation, say, AC plus BD, and that makes AD plus BC, the general idea is this. If you give me any single thing, say you give me 5 grams of this, you should now be able to tell me how many grams of that are going to be made. You should be able to tell me how many grams of that. You should be able to tell me how many grams of that. So basically, basic stoichiometry is just you give me any one number, one, two, three, four, any one of these, I can then jump, I can convert to here, I can convert to here, I can convert to here. I can convert to any of those other ones that we've got up there. So that's kind of the general idea of basic stoichiometry. So what we're going to do today is kind of go back and, for instance, we can do this generic equation again. BD yields AD plus BC. We can take a look at this generic equation. Again. And so really what we're going to be looking at today is this. What happens if you start to do a problem, and instead of just being so kind and giving you one number, what if you think, oh, these guys are great. They gave me uh, five grams of AC, and they're giving me, oh, I don't know, ten grams of BD. Ah, geez, these guys are too considerate. And then they ask, well, how many grams of AD are made? So let's say that that's your basic looking question. So you're like, well, geez, it gave me two numbers. I don't know which one did I jump from. Do I jump from this one? Do I jump from that one to there? Or should I jump from this one? Go ahead. Talk amongst yourselves. What do you think for an answer? Dang, if you said jump from both of them, you're right. All you got to do on this problem is jump from this one to here. When you get done, jump from the 10 grams to this one. And then we're going to talk a little bit more after we do that. But let's go ahead and do one of the examples. All right. The example I've got for you to do is number two in the notes. And it's a reaction of aluminum and cupric chloride. And we've got 12 grams of aluminum, 4 grams of cupric chloride that we've got. So let's go ahead and take a second and let's write a balanced equation for that example of mine. And it gave you aluminum plus cupric chloride, CuCl2, yields AlCl, I'm a plus and minus kind of guy, plus 3 minus 1, so that's 3, plus Cu now will be isolated. And for those of you that have previously thought, geez, use phase labels, get out of my classroom. I'll do it the way I want to. So I'm sorry, no S's and AQ's. They kind of only clutter it up when we're learning how to do this. So we need to balance this equation. And I'm going to do it so that it's whole numbers and no fractions. So I'm going to just slide over here. Ooh, maybe we'll use this blue pen. Three of those, we need two of those. And then we will need two aluminums and we'll need three coppers. So there's our balanced equation in this problem. And so it told me in the problem, see if I can get this right. It said that we've got 12 grams of aluminum and then it comes back and excuse me, and it says that we've got four grams of cupric chloride and the problem actually says what mass of copper is recovered. So all we're going to do in this problem is this. We're going to start with the 12 grams of aluminum, and we're going to convert from it to the copper. So we're not even going to worry about that 4 grams. All we're going to look at is the 12 grams of aluminum, and we're going to convert that. So let's go ahead and do that. 12 grams of aluminum. So we'll draw our line, put our X, and draw our line. There's 27 grams of aluminum. For every one mole of aluminum, put our X and put our line. The next step on this, we've converted to moles. you got to convert to moles before you can make your jump, as I said in the other videos. So now I'm in moles. I'm ready to make my jump. What's my relationship? For every two moles of AL, there are 
three moles of Cu. So for every two moles of Al, there are three moles of Cu. And now I'm not done. I need one more x, one more line. Because remember, when you do stoichiometry, it's made for moles. You got to jump for moles, and when you land, you're in moles. Which means if you want grams, like this problem asks, you've got to do one more step to get from moles to grams to finish. Well, that's going to be easy. Copper weighs 64 grams per one mole. And now let's take a second before we even hit the calculator. Did we do this problem right? Grams of Al, grams of Al, moles of Al, moles of Al, moles of Cu, moles of Cu. This problem looks really good right now. So let's go ahead and plug this in the calculator. We've got uh, on top, we've got 12 times 3 times 64 divided by, the bottom would be 27 times 2, and that's equals to 42.7 grams of copper. Now I'm going to do one thing different. I'm not putting a box around that yet. That's, I don't know if that's an answer. Because here's the catch. I've still got to do one more thing. This was the 12 grams conversion. Now I want to do the exact same thing starting with the 4 grams. I want to do it with the cupric chloride. So let's scroll on up. So if we've got 4 grams of CuCl2, let's jump. But before we can jump from cupric chloride to copper, what have we got to do before we can make the jump? We have to convert this to moles. So cupric chloride would be, let's see, 35 times 2 is 70 and 64. There's 134 grams of cupric chloride per one mole of cupric chloride. Put your X, draw your line. Now that you've changed the moles, you're ready for your jump. So what's your relationship? For every three moles of CuCl2, we should make three moles of Cl. So on top, three moles of Cu. And then on the bottom, three moles of CuCl2. Put an X, put a line, because I need to finish in grams. So just like this step, this gets so repetitive. 64 grams of Cu per one mole of Cu, and that's equal to, and we can put this in our calculator now. Let's see what we get on this one. Uh, what we got here? Four, four times three, well, that's big math, <laughs> 64 divided by bottom, we've got 134 times three times one, of course, 1.91. All right, now, here we've got two answers to this problem. And you know what? Before we can do that, I want to pull aside for a second. I want to talk about one of my great loves, and I love making biscuits. And basically, here's my biscuit recipe. So now don't go off telling everybody this recipe that you hear. But I do, this is my biscuits, I do two cups of self-rising flour. So two cups self-rising flour. Alright, so there's a must. Uh, I'm going to be honest. Don't know if I'm supposed to be, you know, advertising for people, but uh, I like white lily. It's a pretty amazing flour. But anyway, two cups self-rising flour. And then, now this is where I get crazy. Check this out. I go one whole stick of butter. Ah, uh, that's where it's at. Now, I am kind of health conscious. I use margarine, so I try and make it not quite as bad for you. So part of that stick of butter is going to have some water. But anyway, and then usually about a third cup of buttermilk. Dang, I'm getting hungry just thinking about making me some biscuits. So there is how I make biscuits. And, and by the way, I, 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 for personal reference, I, I don't want the non-fat buttermilk. I want fat in my buttermilk. I want a biscuit. 
Real biscuit. Has anybody noticed I'm from Alabama yet? Anyway, so here we go. This is where we get started. So why in the world am I talking about biscuits in the middle of a stoichiometry question? Let's just say you go over to the pantry one day. And I'll go ahead and tell you, this little recipe of mine, it makes eight biscuits the way I cut them out. So I can make eight biscuits. So let's say that we go to the pantry, and in the pantry you all find that I've got about five cups of, say i got five cups of flour over there. And say you start digging around, and oh, i got eight sticks of butter in the pantry. Sticks of butter. Actually, they would probably be in the refrigerator, but hey, who's keeping track? And let's say, man, i just been to the store, i got a gallon of buttermilk. Now, here would be the question. How many biscuits can I make right now out of this? How many biscuits can I make? Well, let's start doing a little looking. I got five cups of flour. It takes two cups of flour to make eight biscuits. Well, let's see. That's five. So basically, I can make two and a half batches of biscuits. So I can make two cups will make eight, another two cups will make eight, and that other one leftover cup, well, that one leftover cup, that would make four more biscuits. So I can make eight and eight and four. I should be able to make 20 biscuits out of that. Sixteen, uh, sixteen's probably more like it, because knowing me, I'm going to spill about a cup of that flour all over myself. The butter, check it out. I got enough, I can make, I could make 64 biscuits. That's how much butter I got. Too bad I can't spell biscuits. Oh, well. You didn't come to this video for spelling. All right. But look at this gallon of buttermilk. Y'all, with well, a gallon of buttermilk, I can make 384 biscuits. We can be rolling in some biscuit dough. Here's my question. What am I going to make? Am I going to make 20 biscuits, 64 biscuits, or 384? Y'all, a gallon of buttermilk does me no good if I've only got enough flour to make 20 biscuits. Eight sticks of butter do me no good if I've only got enough flour to make 20 biscuits. That means I'm not going to cook 64 biscuits. That means I'm not going to cook... 384 biscuits. I'm going to end up cooking 20 biscuits. And now this is what means. The flour in the world of chemistry, the flour is my, I'll call it an LR. That is my limiting reactant. LR, LR, that is my limiting reactant. Because that determines how many biscuits I get to make. Everything else, look at this. The butter, I got excess butter. I got more butter than I'm going to use. Good grief, look at the buttermilk. My buttermilk is an excess. I got more buttermilk than I can ever use. So, the LR, that's the most important thing. Once you know the limiting reactant, you can now figure out anything else in the problem. So let's go back. Based on what we learned about my biscuits, remember, don't go ripping off this recipe. It's pretty awesome. Oh yeah, I like to uh, cook my biscuits in a skillet in the oven, get a cast iron, learn that from somebody. That is actually pretty amazing. Just throw it out there. Anyway, let's go back to that last problem we were doing. And there it is. And we worked it out. So take a look. We had enough aluminum to make 42 grams of copper. We had enough cupric chloride to make 1.91 grams of copper. It's just like the biscuits. 12 grams can make 42. 4 grams to make 1.9. Which one can we make? Y'all, it's like, this is like having a gallon of buttermilk up here. I've got way more aluminum than I need, which means this is my answer. I can make 1.91 grams of copper. I am not going to make 42.7 grams. That also tells me that this 
is my limiting reactant. It tells me that this is my excess reactant. And now I'm going to slip up here. This is my LR and this is my EX. And this is really important to know that that is my limiting reactant. All right. The first problems I'm giving you for homework are just going to be problems with generic looking equations. A plus C D yields A D plus C. The first problem are going to be generic. They're going to give you like five grams of this, eight grams of this. And it's going to say find LR and find EX. And you're going to be immediately like, well, which one do I pick? Well, here's the beautiful thing. It doesn't matter what you try and jump to. If it's me, I would jump to the C. Why? For one reason. You know how much you've got to write all this stuff out. I'm going to write out the shortest thing I can do. Get your answer. Whichever one produces the least amount of C ends up being your LR, and then the other one is your EX. Now, for somebody that comments, hey, there's shorter ways of doing this. Yeah, there is, and I'm going to teach you that. But for right now, we're going to do it this way, and that's awesome. All right, so homework on this is number one uh, on the limiting reactant page, and we're just going to do number one, A, B, C, and D. And in part three of this series, we're going to actually pick up and see what happens after we get the LR and the X. Anyway, thank you all for watching. I uh, feel like I should draw something. Uh, maybe a guy with a big nose and some glasses and like, okay. Let's make him cross-eyed and really happy though. So we're going to give him a big old smile. Maybe one tooth. Okay, I'll quit now. <laughs>